They can be girls with her, that girl side, you know what I mean? They, you know, they, fags have, have the heart and soul of a woman with a sex drive of a man, basically, which is why they're so inordinately and flagrantly promiscuous. You know, you've heard of stories of, you know, the bag, bag, bath club and so forth of, of having sex with a hundred men a night. You know, can you imagine with your sex drive of a man being able to fuck all the women in the world and that all the women who want to fuck you, 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 you fuck a hundred and nine. No, I don't know about you, but you know, if you have the sex drive of a man, you know. And uh, no, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm so hip to that kind of thing. I've, I've so been around. I've only had one homosexual experience in my life. It's when I was 16, mutual masturbation. But uh, again, starting from her and, you know, and, and being with the dog, that's the biggest education of the world, just spending Un uncounted hours in public parks, uncounted hours, and also in natural forests. You can go down to uh, Apalachicola Forest, for that matter, and, <laughs> and uh, there's a place called uh, Lost Lake there, and it's a day use area only now, which is why. That's not about a homosexual cruising ground. That's a place that's got a, a, a lake there, so several acres with a perimeter road going around it and an entrance drive, and you drive in, and there'll be guys in, in vehicles, single guys in vehicles spaced all around. Mm -hmm. And as you drive in, there'll be one or two of them staked out of the entrance to see who's coming in. They want to get dibs on you if you look good. So if you look good, they'll start following you, and they'll follow you around, and when you park somewhere, they'll park about 50 yards away. There's another park that was notorious, although Gwinnett County is really tightened down on them. That's Lucky Shoals. Park on Britt Road, which is between Old Norcross Road and Jimmy Carter Road, and it's a, an extension of uh, uh, Singleton Road, I guess, something like that. And yeah, it's Lucky Shoals Park. You have to check it out sometime. I opened that park up. Me and me and Ranger did when it was built. Uh, it was being built in 1990-91. I opened that park up, and that got so bad as a homosexual cruising ground that it had a circular drive at the end with you know an island of vegetation and trees in the middle. And and so it would be like guys park you know all around you know wasn't but you know it was you know facing I don't know you don't call it parallel park you know regular parking slot. And so they'd all be sitting around there. They'd be holding a magazine, you know, like this, so they could masturbate, you know, underneath it. And then uh, the other, the cruisers would be cruising around and around in a circle. Oh, it's funny. And um, finally, though, it attracted the attention of, uh, of, of Gwinnett County. And uh, I got to know the officers there and uh, everything. <laughs> it's embarrassing, you know, you're a single guy there, but at least I got an excuse. I got a dog. If I was a homosexual cruising, I'd make sure I had a dog, tell you the truth. Because <laughs> any single guy in there would be pegged as, as a homo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cops would pull, pull up to me and they go, hey, you know, how you doing? I'm, hey, great. And he said, uh, well, how's the crowd? tonight. <laughs> I said, well, if you mean uh, the soliciting for sodomy crowd, uh, <laughs> they've been keeping it down a little bit, you know, and if they bug me, I tell them they don't know what they're risking, man. Gwinnett County is undercover in here. They come in here and arrest 27 people over watch our One time Gwinnett County did, not there, but at another part, I think it was Shorty Owl uh, part, uh, did a, uh, a undercover, you know, sodomy operation on lunch. Arrested 20, 27 guys over lunch. And it showed the vehicles that they were impounding, and they were company vehicles. <laughs> yeah, they were like celebrities, and, you know, buddy, just company vehicles, uh, company trucks. Uh, oh, but I'd hate to have been them. And, you know, can you imagine that having their family and everything soliciting for sodomy? I guess it would, I don't guess, I don't know if sodomy's against the law anymore. I might be now just soliciting for sex in a public park, but it was soliciting for sodomy and everything. Oh, sorry, so give me a huge insight. And, uh, I, and I know what goes on in the, uh, the truck parts, too, because I've known prostitutes that work these big transport cities and everything. They'll just get in their car and they'll go driving around with the window open and wave to guys. And if, if a guy wants to talk to them, he'll flash his lights or, or wave at them. They'll just put, stop and get, if there's, you know, 200 cent lights pulled up. Mm -hmm. And that's what homosexuals do, too, because a lot of these uh, rough, tough truck, truck drivers are gay. Did you ever see the Cops episode? The t you know, the TV show Cops? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you, there was one episode where the police stopped a guy. He was a trucker. He was running down the street and he was wearing nothing but, uh, 
uh, leopard print, print, print panties uh, with pantyhose, uh, a woman's wig, and woman's makeup on. And he was a real man too. He's a, you know, a real, real, real guy. And it turned out that he had uh, got a guy in the cab of his truck for homosexual sex, and the guy grabbed his wallet and run. And, and <laughs> it was so funny to see a rough, tough truck driver, and he was too, big old strapping guy. Talk like a truck driver and everything. He didn't want no pansy waist either. And he's wearing this pantyhose, leopard skin breeze, and a woman's wig and, and with a woman's makeup on. It was, mm. Oh, that was a hilarious. And they replayed that several times on Surprise. Uh, you, do you guys watch that show? Every yeah, once in a while. Every once in a while. I, I like to watch it. Uh, the big, it shows how police officers work. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's very impressive. That's why I know police officers are so that my personal encounters with them. Right. You know, back in the sixties or fifties, I mean they not shit I I mean they were just they were just guys that couldn't get a good job. Mm -hmm. Basically. Just goons, more or less. Uh, of course they were individuals. Right. But uh I, my my hats are off to the police, the modern police, because almost uniformly just in the smaller departments like Duluth and Shambly do you see uh, people that are obese and that are just not up to par. I mean, I like to say with the Shambly police, I've had my share of encounters with them too, plenty. And the Shambly police are just the type that would drive up and jump out and, and shoot the victim instead of the perpetrator. <laughs> really? One time I had a panhandler chasing me, and I flagged down it because I told him to get lost and go away. He was in Shambly, and, you know, he'd come from downtown from Martin and come up there in front of the Walgreens and everything, and I always had my bat with me. I, I won't get out, as, as I said to that Cherokee officer, I, I take it in everywhere but banks and government buildings like post office. I carry it everywhere, or did. Anyway, I had my bat in my hand, actually. I told him, you know, get lost, get the fuck out, and he started giving me a bunch of shit, and he started coming after me, and uh, I saw a Shambo police drive by, I flagged him down, and, and, uh, and it turned out there were a couple of them, and they came in, and I ran up to them, to an officer with him chasing me and my bat wasn't deployed it was just still folded you know I hadn't he didn't even know I had it I hadn't waved it or nothing I just had it and you know if I can run I'm not going to hit someone you know I, I'm, I'm obligated to try to get away you just you know you can't stand there and hit them you you got to try to flee okay and I ran out to one officer and and then another officer grabbed the guy and then I was talking to one officer, and the guy, the beggar, the panhandler, broke loose. He was a black pack panhandler, and came after me again while I'm talking to an officer. I had to run away again. That officer grabbed him, and then another officer drove up and started getting my story. And I called his attention. I said, just to make sure he saw it, because you know it's only nine inches. I said, I have an expanded bat in my hand, and he started going, "What? What are you doing with that? You can't carry that." And it, okay. Here I am, a guy chasing me, running for my life, and now he's chewing my ass out. So, <laughs> really, they're, they're just the kind of guy that would drive up and shoot the victim instead of the perpetrator. <laughs> they are. They're sorry. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, with, with notable exceptions like that, most larger metropolitan uh, departments, the police, uh, DeKalb North, great, great. I've I, I run across a couple of bad officers. Gwinnett County. Gwinnett County South, man, I swear, it seems that half of those, their officers probably have psychology degrees. They, they're, they're good. They're really good. And these are the dudes that chase and fight and shoot, too, you know, you know. What, is it? what was it? DeKalb, DeKalb County in that period of time killed 12 people in about 15 months. And guess what? And, and shot a lot of other ones. And, you know, they had a big fury and they had the Blue Ribbon panel investigated all, including, the, you know, the Baptist ministers, the whole works. And every shooting was justified. They were all good shootings. None of them were bad shootings. So these are the same dudes that fly, chase, and, and shoot, but yet can be professional and, and, and arrive at the truth of the situation. That's what saved me every damn time, is that it was a professional police officer, you know. Because here would be that woman, Pam, someone that called into the journal saying I was crazy. Well, she's the same woman that I asked her to hook her dogs up, and she finally did after I had asked her a million times. And I made the mistake of smarting off to her. I said, you're the type to give dog owners a bad name. And she went like that. I went and did another lap around Murphy County. I came back to my van. She had her 6'4 husband waiting for me. Yeah, they she'd gone home. They got in their Mercedes and driven around to the parking lot. She had her great big old husband waiting for me, telling me he was going to kick my ass. I was carrying a 36-inch solid bat. 
and and I just let him back me around the parking lot. It was a, it was a slow motion chase, and the whole time I'm telling him call the police, call the police, let the police handle it. And the woman watched me, and she saw I was I was about smacking, you know. Uh, it's, again, it's incumbent upon me to try to get away. It is, but I'm not going to turn my back and run either. That's a good way to get cold caught. So, so it was a slow motion chase backward, and I'm, I'm doing it the right way. And so they call the police. They tell the police a bunch of lies. This is the cab north. I, I fled and called the police and told them where I was at another parking lot I called in. I just wanted to get away from them, not be in the vicinity while the police were coming. So the police came to me, took my stick. He said, first thing, he says, where's the stick? Right here. Okay. Took my story. Then another unit arrived. He, he sat on me. And while well, the first guy that took my stick went around and got their story, they told him their pack of lies. That the cab north officer came back around, got out, opened the back door of his car. I thought, damn, is he going to put me in that? He got my stick out, gave me my stick back, and he said, I told those people that you have a right to carry this stick, and you have a right to defend yourself if they feel, you know, that you feel you're afraid of their dog. And I guess he left it unsaid that he told them that what the guy had done is just committed an assault on me. It's what, it, what he did. He's forced me to flee. So that's how good police officers are. They, they, every time, every thir of all those 30 times, every time they have arrived at the truth in that I did not act unlawfully. They, they, they may not be aware they, that they know the whole story. Every single time. And that, that just reflects so good on them because these people lie. They tell outrageous lies. That woman I was telling you about the Stone Mountain, I called to a dog 150 yards away, sprayed one, stick the other. Well, she come running up saying, you're just adding them on. <laughs> she said, this same woman, in doing the next year, I saw her twice out at Stone Mountain, moving in the same direction I was on the trail. So I just kind of trailed her from a discreet distance. And both of those times, her dog attacked the child. Once they attacked a little African-American boy, and his father had to grab the boy, and put him on his shoulders. Another time, they attacked a white boy that was fishing there with his father and ran the little boy into the lake. Okay. Now this, now this same chick and the same dogs, I went and and did six miles around the over well over an hour later, and I come back and she is there with the police, still not part of police, telling them that I had sprayed all every kind of thing verbally and everything, and the police asked me the story. I told him, the dogs confronted me, put me in fear, discharged my pepper twice. So, he understood. That's what I mean. They can understand when they're talking to a pro. Most police officers are pros, and they can understand when they're talking to a pro rather than just a civilian, you know. But that's, that's an example of how the police have, have the, the quality of the police work is that she was mad enough to wait for over an hour, have the police there when I got back, tell them a pack of lies, and he was able to rapidly arrive at the truth. All right. the matter. Back on point for just a little bit. The uh, from from '97 until 2007, mm -hmm. I guess you worked for Taper, correct? And during that time, what kind of marketing did you do, or what kind of telephone solicitation did you do with that? Oh, uh, signing, residential signing, residential signing. Yeah. How did how did you how did you Pick your people out when you're doing telemarketing. Do you look at the No, it was a process. Or? It was an education. I just got into uh, obtaining sighting leads when I went to work for Tabor. I'd had a job for one other company and been trained. That was a Dixie Home Crafters uh, Superior Sighting mm -hmm. Window. Same guy owns both of them. How about one more copy if there's any more in there? And uh, so I was just doing a traditional way, getting a crisscross directory calling blinds. Uh, just getting in an area and just calling blind and skipping the apartments. Don't worry if this ground in or anything like that. And skipping uh, skipping the apartments. Okay. Okay. And skipping the apartments. Uh, but it progressed. Later on, I started realizing where the market was, which was in this defective siding where there's so much of it. I had been trained and, and uh, solicitors had been trained until then to avoid the defective siding. Mm -hmm. uh, because there were so much lawsuits going around. Mm -hmm. They sent a salesman over there, he'd do his uh, song and dance, and then people say, well, thank you, but we're, we think we're going to uh, litigate this thing. Mm -hmm. So they were getting burning with a lot of time, so they were trained to avoid it. But finally, though, in, in uh, 90, uh, 98, late 98, someone called in off a uh, yellow pages that Tabor had, and they said, I got my Elk Louisiana Pacific settlement, it's $900 for the whole house. That's 
what it got down to. I thought to myself, hold on, $900. I can find him $900 in savings. I can have a special sale going on to save $900. Mm -hmm. this, this amount is moved, don't matter anymore. And when, once I came to that conclusion, I started doing what everyone else was not doing. I started going after it, systematically telesurveying and identifying the subdivisions in starting out the large real zip codes, 303434445, I mean, that's the home of defective siding, you know. That's 40, 50,000 houses in those, those zip codes with defective siding. I started, I got a map. And I started going and identifying each subdivision, what kind of siding it had, identifying the subdivision with defective siding, and then systematically telemarketing those subdivisions using a street directory, a crisscross street directory. Mm -hmm. And then it got on, uh, I, I did leaflets for several years too, which did not look like a leaflet. It looked like it's a note off a notepad. Mm -hmm. I would hand letter it, please call me if you've ever wanted, uh, thought about vinyl siding or hardy plank siding. Mm -hmm. I promise to give you the best price you'll ever see, name, mm -hmm. brands, quality, work. Call me, please, day or night. Mac, that's where I come up with Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's straight, you know, right. siding. It mm -hmm. looked like it was a note. Mm -hmm quarter page rather than a leaf. It was reproduced, but it right. was in my hand lettering. Right. And it looked like someone left them a note. Mm -hmm. They go right up to it and grab it and read it. Mm -hmm. Someone left them a note. Mm -hmm. And it was my leaflet. If it had been a leaflet, they'd have taken a crop over and up and not paid any attention to it. I did that for several years. That worked. And then I really got sophisticated. I'd take a voice recorder and I would drive through the subdivisions and survey the siding on each house. It was a quick process. Mm -hmm. it, the street numbers went 40, 40, 40, 50, 40, 60. Then, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real quick process. And I would literally, I'd go to these subdivisions, which I already knew had bad siding. I would just drive through them, survey them, and see the ones with, whose siding was wrecked. Right. And I dictated into the thing, you know. Mm -hmm. 40, 50, uh, beat it, uh, it, you know, I have a shorthand, uh, uh, and a verbal shorthand, tell the exact type of siding, flat panel or beaded, mm -hmm. and the condition of it, mm -hmm. you know. I'd have a candy, uh, super candy, etc. And uh, then I would transcribe that onto a legal pad. It was a time-consuming process, but once you had this, then you could work them for years until they got their home resided. I would transcribe the addresses <clears throat> onto a, a legal pad and then uh, leave, a, leave a space and go to the street directory mm -hmm. and look up that street in the street directory and get their name and number. Mm -hmm. And there's your list. There's a list of people that need it and have to have it. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And it, it works good. It works good. It works good. And, oh, and here's the approach though. Because you already know they need it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really okay. You go, oh, hey, Mr. Jones, hey, Mac, siding guy here, working your subdivision there. Notice your house the other day about the siding there, mm -hmm. that LP siding you got. I wanted to leave you a price for installed hardy plank, 590 a square. Be glad to help you. Make that mm -hmm. more. Okay. If they said thank you or get lost, let it go. If they said, well, how much does that equal? Right. 